So if that's already enough to convince you to get a C63 AMG or just about anything else, please don't forget to use Car Vertical, the super-powered super search that cross-references a number of databases from around the globe to tell you all the information you need to know on any potential used car purchase, including mileage issues, potential clocking problems, whether a car has been accident damaged, regardless of write-off status, if it's been used as a taxi, and if it has outstanding finance. And they'll even give you hints and tips, common failure points to look out for on some of the more popular models. Car Vertical is available on both desktop and mobile. All you need is just 60 seconds and either a registration plate or VIN number. Best of all, for a 10% discount on the service, please make sure to use my link in the description down below and don't forget my discount code, which is JM. And now, back to the action. Here in Britain, for the last 25 years, if you are on the hunt for an upmarket, high-performance, daily drivable car, it has been essentially a three-horse race between the clear market leader, the BMW M3, Audi's RS4, and various iterations of Mercedes-Benz C-Class AMG. I have always historically been something of a BMW fan, and have owned examples of both the E46 and E92. When I had my E46, I was constantly thinking about changing it for something else, potentially an RS4 or this, the 6.2-litre W204 generation Mercedes-Benz C63. However, for the entirety of the time that I had that car, to do so would have cost a lot more money. But now, things have changed, and today, you can pick up an example of what could be one of Merck's best performance cars for significantly less than the equivalent M3. So, time then to revisit an old favourite and see if it's as good as I remember. The W204 Generation C-Class arrived in 2007 with the high-performance C63 variant arriving fairly quickly after. And there were a few key differences between this and its W203-based predecessor, the C55. By the time this car had landed, Mercedes and AMG had been integrated for quite some time. So for this generation of car, they said it was the first C-Class AMG to be designed with AMG's input from the ground up. I've seen a few sources claim that the whole car is an AMG original creation, but um, that, I think, may be gilding the lily just a little bit too much. In any case, highlights include this gorgeous and sharply profiled body, which to modern eyes actually is maybe a, a little subtle, though still easily identifiable as something a little bit more special than a C180 elegance. In addition, great attention was apparently paid to making sure that, unlike AMGs of old, this wasn't simply a straight-line bruiser, and they wanted to make sure it was a car that could handle too. So, much of the front suspension in particular was taken from the CLK Black. But let's be honest here, if you're interested in a Mercedes-Benz AMG, there's only one bit you want to pay any attention to, and that is the engine, which here was also something rather special. Making its C-Class debut, this car has an example of the fabled M156, and an absolute powerhouse it is. Displacing 6.2 litres, in spite of the 6.3 badging, which is a historic reference, this car makes 457 horsepower and 443 pound-foot of torque. That's 600 newton metres. Which may not sound all that impressive considering the displacement, but a couple of things to note. First off, it is well known that in the C-Class, this engine is very very much pegged back. If you remap it and all you do is essentially unlock its potential, you've got yourself a 510 horsepower engine. And in any case, it massively outgunned its rivals. The E46 M3, which granted predated this car, has 340 horsepower, with the later V8 E90 generation car having 420. Likewise, the equivalent Audi of this generation would be the B8 RS4, with the naturally aspirated 4.2, and that made 444 horsepower horsepower, so just shy. But most tellingly is the difference in torque, because the M3 makes just under 300 pound-foot, the Audi makes about 317, and this 443. A big difference. 
Unfortunately, as was common with Mercedes of the time, the Achilles heel is the gearbox. Here you had what was for them a bit of an advancement, a seven-speed MCT, multi-clutch transmission, which you might imagine to be a dual-clutch equivalent. It's not. It's a weird hybrid of torque converter with a series of clutches that give you the ability to lock it up more easily, but the fact is, in practice, it drives like an old-school auto. And from day one until the day it was retired, it was certainly considered a weak link in the chain. And this is the point in the review where normally I'd like to put my foot down and show you what all of that will do. However, a road has been closed, so you'll have to wait just another couple of minutes, but I promise you I shall be putting my foot down as soon as I can. In any case, a few other things to note. The interior of this certainly feels to me like a big step up over the E46. I know that people will tell me comparing this with an E46 is unfair, and a few years ago, I would have certainly agreed. They were never on sale at the same time. However, prices have now changed so much, with that being the more expensive car, certainly at the bottom end of the market, I don't think it's any more an unfair comparison. But in any case, compared with, say, the E90 generation, it's a closer run thing, with both having, I think, their own appeal. The infotainment of the BMW felt a little bit more modern. This one was a little bit more out of date, though mercifully, I am told, there is now a solution which will give you Android Auto and Apple CarPlay utilizing the original screen. One significant difference between the Mercedes, Audi, and BMW offerings of the time were the body styles that you could have. So, for the E46 M3, you could have either coupe or convertible. For the E90 generation, you could have coupe, convertible, or saloon. However, the Audi RS4 in B8 trim was exclusively estate only, or Avant in Audi parlance. But for the Mercedes, you had no drop-top option. Instead, you had the choice of either saloon, later a coupe, and also this, the estate, which is a rather wonderful way to get your little kids and your big dog about, as this car's owner, Christian, does. He has, over the past few years, had various other cars, including a CLS and, more recently, an FK8 generation Honda Civic Type R, which he loved and is also a very practical thing. But it is a car that really requires you to be in the mood. We're now at that aforementioned stretch of road, so I'm going to put my foot down and see what this car will do. It's going to be absolutely no surprise to anybody to hear that that engine really is the star of the show, though its character is something of a surprise. It being a nice big displacement by I think anybody's standards, not just European V8, you'd think it would be supremely torquey. And sure, it's got plenty of shove from low down, but get it to about 4,000 RPM, the red line is just over seven, and it pulls even harder. It really digs in and, provided you've got traction, it will fire you down the road. Now that I've mentioned it, let's talk about traction, shall we? Because it, along with the gearbox, is regarded as one of the biggest weaknesses of these cars. For whatever reason, and I really cannot fathom what it is, Mercedes created the most powerful and torquiest car in the segment, and then did not fit it as standard with a limited slip differential, and even more annoyingly gave it desperately, woefully small tyres. This has at the rear two 5.5 section wide items, which is the same as the E46 M3. And that was a car that already had a reputation for being, on occasion, a little bit tail happy. Then remember that although this is a bit heavier, it also has something like 75% more torque. Now, you could get a limited slip differential for these. In some cases, it was part of a performance pack, but at other times, it was simply a standalone item and a box that you had to tick when ordering. Not many of them had it. And today, even those that did have sometimes been upgraded with an aftermarket item. But this car is that most unusual of things. It is an entirely standard C63. Stock suspension, stock engine, stock wheels, and aren't they gorgeous, stock brakes, the lot. 
as you can probably tell, it isn't the warmest or driest day out there, but, and it's rare that I can say this in Britain, it is actually better than it looks. And I think with this, like many a supercharged Jaguar, provided that the tyres you've got are decent, the road conditions are suitable, and you aren't overly generous with the right foot, traction shouldn't be too much of an issue. Which isn't to say that it won't be, but it shouldn't. Around town and at lower speeds, particularly over broken sections of tarmac, you do detect that the ride is on the firm side. It's a passive setup in this car. The little controller down here, which has comfort, sport, sport plus and manual modes, is chiefly for the gearbox. Doesn't really change all that much else. But once you've got a little bit of speed behind you, the road improves, becomes a little bit less demanding. It is actually a fairly well set up thing. And that is impressive because it really is heavier than the equivalent M3. Those in the real world weighed about 1,560 kilos. These more like 1,850. That's a lot. And I would say it's largely for that reason that you read just about any automotive group test of this, the RS4 and the M3, it will be the M3 that comes out on top because around a track, it would certainly spank the equivalent AMG. Even on a very fast section of B road, if you really, really care about carrying that extra bit of speed, the M3 will be a better car. If you want to row your own gears, the M3 will give you that option. However, this does not mean that the C63 is a car that you should ignore. Far, far from it. And as time goes on, I find myself becoming less and less interested in stuff like the M3 and more keen on stuff like this because it's a car with character. Yes, it's somewhat dominated by that engine, but unlike some other AMGs that I've driven, it isn't ruined by that engine. It still has a starring role, but now there's also a supporting cast which has talents more in line with the lead. The steering, for example, is a particular highlight. We're currently doing 35 mile an hour behind a frustratingly slow learner in a Fiat 500, but uh, you know what? Good luck to them, they're learning to drive and I think we should be celebrating that rather than moaning about it. And uh, even so, you still get this nice sense of weight and connection to the road. There's even a little bit of texture, feel and feedback from it as well. The brakes are a little on the soft and light side, but generally speaking, they've done absolutely fine. And if you think they're not up to the task, well, they're one of the items that got changed if you spec a performance pack. All right, let's have a little bit more fun. I'm gonna stick the car over into manual mode, which granted isn't necessarily the best, but does give me control. So, <clears throat> let's go. Direction changes for something that weigh this much really are quite impressive. Grip levels today actually are pretty good. I gave it the big one in first and I didn't have any issues whatsoever. The car is currently sat on a set of Goodyear Eagle F1 asymmetric fives. Previously, it had Michelins on and Christian says he quite likes the Eagles. They're a little bit better in uh, inclement conditions, but the Michelins did have better feel and a little bit better grip in the dry. As this car is used all year round, the Eagles sound like a fairly decent compromise. And if I were gonna do anything to this car, it might be to put some slightly wider tires on the back and a limited slip differential. Makes a good noise too though, even in absolutely standard guise. Though, I know if you want them to sound a little bit fruitier, the best thing to do is to put on a decat, secondary decat of course, and an X-pipe. That will make the car just a little bit louder, not silly loud, but it changes the character of the noise, makes it a lot racier, higher pitched. I really, really like it. I was always curious about Mercedes' insistence on putting all of the stalks on the same side of the wheel, which is fine when there's one of them, but then this car there's three. You've got one for the wheel itself, one for your cruise control, and one that does your indicator, wash wipe, and all that stuff. 
the paddles are actually quite pleasing in the hand, really very nice, it feels solid, much better than in many an Audi product, they're just unforgivably poor. And I will say one thing, if you are comparing this with the E46 M3, the automatic gearbox option there is the SMG, the semi-automated manual. And for daily duties, driving around town when you want it in auto mode, this is vastly superior because it is essentially an auto box where that is a manual pretending to be an auto. Perhaps even worse, in the M3, the tech also wasn't quite there to give you those lightning quick changes that later stuff like the Ferraris and Maseratis got. So for me, the SMG is just a, a nothing box. In the E90 generation car, you then had the DCT, which leapfrogged this in terms of usability. But again, around town, the DCT was never quite as good as this. If you're someone that intends to use this mostly for daily stuff, that could be an important selling point. Fuel. Well, it depends on who you ask, because this car's owner, Christian, says that on a run he will get between 25 and 28 to the gallon, which the internet has corroborated. But if you have a slightly heavier foot, or you're doing a lot of urban driving, or just fun driving, expect your average to be closer to around 20. Though again, if compared with an M3 and both the E46 and E90 are about as bad as each other, regardless of what BMW claim, they'll do about 23 over a very long average. When I had my E46 M3, it did about 23.6, and that was largely motorway journeys, so that's an optimistic figure. None of them are going to be that good. Parts are available, some stuff like brakes and that can be expensive, but again, you shouldn't wear through them too quickly. I love the response from this thing, it's got so much low down. Truthfully, for a lot of people, I think the best mode to have this car in would be one of the autos. I've currently got it in sport, and actually it's doing a pretty good job. The fact that the gearbox may be a little bit lethargic and old school is more than made up for by the fact that the engine has so much grunt low down. With the E90 generation, M3 in particular, actually, it really, really, really needs a lot of revs to make progress, whereas this just doesn't. And so you can appreciate the whole thing a little bit more. You don't have to be quite so on it to really get the best from it. And I'm sure if you really, really pushed hard, which I'm not going to do today, maybe you'd find this car coming apart slightly. But I've already put my foot down a fair bit and carried enough speed through plenty of bends to know that um, those limits are more than high enough to have plenty of fun on the public roads. talking once again about the more boring stuff in terms of practicality the car has plenty of room in the back and of course this being the estate the boot is very generous too you also have a sunroof which i really like and appreciate though we're not sure if that was standard or optional i want to say it might be standard on the c63 but somebody who knows more about these things please hop into the comments and tell me Special mention must also be given to the AMG's seats. Sculpted, comfortable and pretty, they strike a perfect balance between the M3's more comfort-orientated items and the Audi's optional but very firm buckets. It was in 2011 that these cars were facelifted, though I think as these things go, it was fairly subtle. My research didn't tell me anything significant that changed, but again, if I've got that wrong, please do pop into the comments and tell me. So, if you are thinking of buying yourself a C63, what do you need to look out for? Well, first and foremost, though they are generally mechanically solid, early cars did suffer a few issues with the engines, particularly regarding to head bolts, but by now, I would expect they've all been sorted. The gearboxes are not impervious, though here, unlike some of the later turbocharged cars, they do seem to fare a bit better. However, while there are many, many buyer's guides out there, and you should certainly read those ahead of looking at any car, there is one thing that has thus far stopped me from buying a C63. And it's a terrible, terrible thing to have to talk about, but unfortunately it is also inescapable when it comes to these cars. There are many, many videos out there of people driving cars in questionable fashion through the likes of Birmingham and Bradford Town Centre, running red lights and doing all sorts of awful, awful things that give all petrol heads a bad name. And I would wager that many of these videos have been from behind the wheel of an AMG Mercedes. And this generation, I would say, is one of the first to have really gained that reputation. They had it before, but with these, it really took off. And that's unfortunate from both ends, because it means that when you come to buy one of these cars, there's a very high chance they've had a rather difficult life. And 
when you come to sell the car, the sort of people interested in buying a cheap C63, which is what I would have been able to afford, are also unusual types. I am an awful, awful human being for saying that, but talk to any C63 owner and it seems to be true. Christian, I think, has been very wise with this one because buying a totally and completely standard low mile silver estate He's very much minimized his chances of buying anything that's had a, a tough life. But the one I want would be a, a red saloon or coupe with a few miles on it. And unfortunately, most of them have had at least one owner who hasn't really cared about it. And that is unfortunate. But I do still want one because these are cars with a magnificent combination of talents. And though I was saying to Christian earlier, I keep doing this to myself. I say that I need a nice, sensible car and then wind up looking at stuff like a C63 when the fact is I don't need a 63. I need, say, like an S-Class with a nice, boring diesel engine that's economical and comfortable. I've got other cars to go fast in. However, I am a petrol head at heart. I see this dirty great big V8 and go, mm, yeah, it's, but, uh, but V8, it's lovely. And even the gearbox isn't the killjoy that I remember it. It responds similarly to a very well set up ZF six speed and I've had cars like that and they've been fine. As my daily, that's a compromise. I'm willing to make and the one thing about the c63 and i think it's true also of the m3 and rs4 of this generation these are the last performance cars you can buy before you do have to start compromising they're practical they're fast they're easy to maintain easy to service relatively speaking and that's the thing if you want say a more interesting car to drive something more exciting there are loads of those out there and loads of those out there at sensible money but they will come with compromise. A 911, better to look at, better to drive, rarer, more interesting, more exciting, and maybe more special than this, but it's cramped inside. The two back seats are token back seats. You can get proper sized adults in this. The boot is a, a joke by comparison to this. A Jaguar XKR, for example, same thing. Lovely to drive, great badge, much better image, but doesn't have the space, doesn't have the practicality. And this is to say nothing if you then want to go to a full-on supercar, McLaren, Ferrari, Lamborghini or the like. In the real world, they might not even be any quicker than one of these, but they are going to be compromised. So as a do-everything, go-anywhere kind of car, well, anywhere there's tarmac, this is potentially about as good as it gets. And even better, it used to be the case that you could get yourself an E46 M3 for about 10 grand, and one of these was 18. One of these is still about 15 to 18 at the bottom end of the market with very, very nice examples at sort of 30 to 40. And now your entry point for an M3, and it would be one you don't want to buy, a convertible SMG with loads of miles, is about 16 grand. And the M3 you do want to buy, manual, coupe, low miles, looked after, that could be 25 to 30 grand. And it's still probably going to have issues. This though, me likey. So, there we have it. That is the W204 generation Mercedes C63 AMG. And at some point now, I really am going to have to get my hands on the W205 that came after. But it's going to have to be really good to beat this. Oh. Anyway, a huge thank you to Christian for bringing his car out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.